John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode three, titled, There Was Never Trouble Getting a Job, featuring the story of Donegal, a stone carver who migrated to Barrie, Vermont, from Scotland. In the previous episode, we went back to the 1930s in Barrie, in the time of the Great Depression. We heard Pat's story about how he became an umbrella repairman, why his family emigrated from Ireland, and his brief experience on a poor farm. For this episode and the next three episodes, we will be staying in the Great Depression. As a stone carver, Donegal would have been one of the highest paid workers in the granite industry. The stone carvers were the ones that sculpted the stone into its finished form. They worked in enclosed buildings called sheds. From their hands, intricate roses, the Blessed Mother, or angel wings emerged from the stone. To be a stone carver, one had to go through a grueling apprenticeship that was longer than any other apprenticeship in the granite industry. For a skilled worker like Donegal, there would always be another job waiting for him in the granite industry. Moreover, the granite industry did well relative to other industries during the Depression, at least in Barrie, Vermont. Even when the granite industry took its biggest dive in 1930, it was still producing twice as much as its biggest competitor in Georgia. You'd think that someone in Donegal's position wouldn't have to worry too much, even in a tough economy. He was highly skilled and highly employable. Barry's granite industry actively recruited workers like Donegal. Shed owners brought over skilled migrants from the famed granite towns across Europe, such as Aberdeen, Scotland, which saved them money on not having to train unskilled Americans. But for all that, stone carving was hard work that wore down the body and the mind. I studied some archived photographs of stone carvers working in sheds from the early 20th century. In one photograph from the Corti and Novelli shed dated circa 1902, a boy who looks to be no older than 10 looks directly at the camera with glowering eyes, like he'd rather be anywhere else. The contrast between the placid faces on the sacred sculptures being carved and the angry and worn face of the boy is striking. Stone carvers, in spite of their relative prestige in the granite industry, had much reason to be angry and worried. Italian carvers were used to the protections and rights of the labor unions they had back in the old country. Granite workers endured two wage cuts during the Depression. On top of that, they had to worry about the stone dust, which was said to cut up their lungs like little knives. It took years of organizing and strikes for granite workers in Barrie to win some of the rights protections, and wages their European brethren had. The Corti and Novelli shed features the name of a famous Italian carver, Elia Corti. But this is not a story about a locally famous man. This is a story about a modest carver who himself admitted that he was, quote, never with the best of them. I don't have a photo of Donegal specifically, And I can't find any photographs taken from when he told his story as part of the Federal Writers Project in the late 1930s. At the time he was interviewed, he would have been in the trade for a long time. If such a photograph existed, perhaps his face would be placid and peaceful, his mouth turned into a slight smile, a modest badge of a long and successful career and years of wisdom. Or... Maybe his face would be tight, his mouth shut and pulled into a straight line, lest it were to open and all of his fears spill out. The Depression reignited a lot of fears. Fears of machines and automation. Fears of war. Fears of no jobs and no future. Donegal's oral history was recorded by Roldis Richmond as part of the Federal Writers Project. It was likely recorded between 1936 and 1939, during the Great Depression. His story is performed by Greg Hooker. I learned the stone-cutting trade in Scotland when I was in my teens. 
But Mary and I was both of a mind to get away to a new country, though love of the old was never lost. There were men folks of her family aching to lay me by the heels, and I knew it. And from America came letters telling of this great country with all its jobs. They said a carver like myself would make a fortune in no time over here. Well, whether I believed it or not, over we came. And poor little Mary was sick on the trip across. We had cousins whose forefathers had settled Caledonia County here in Vermont. You know of the Scottish settlements in Rygate, Barnet, St. Johnsbury, on the east side of the state, by the Connecticut River. So from Montreal we went there and stayed a time, but it was not what we wanted. There was granite quarrying in Rygate, but it was a disappointment to me. I kept hearing tales of the big sheds in Concord, New Hampshire, in Quincy, Massachusetts, and in Barrie. The people of Rygate were more for farming the land, dairying as such. I was no farmer, although since I left off work I have taken to this small garden of ours. We went on to Quincy, and that was not to our liking either, being like the other extreme of Rygate. We were lonely there in some way. Then we tried Concord, and I worked there until a letter came from a good friend of mine working in Barry telling of the coming of the Scottish cutters there, saying the stone was by way of being the best ever, and just the stone for a carver like myself to work on. Fine stone, with a fine grain, hard, but not brittle. So it was to Barry we came, and we've been here since that time. At the turn of the century it was, as I remember, Barry was filled and swarming with stone cutters from Italy, Spain, Scotland, and Ireland. There was never trouble getting a job, and if you would leave one place for some reason or other, more jobs were waiting. It was a wild, unsettled time. There were many rough, wild men who came to work on the granite. Some sent back home for their families and settled down here, steady and good. Others had not thought of settling down, but came only for the big money, the drinking, the good times. Then they would go away to cut stone some other place leaving behind a bad name and maybe some girl a-weeping. There were fights, there were dark deeds and stormy times. The people born here blamed us for what the bad ones did. There were many solemn and dour ones among the natives here, just as there are among the Scottish country folk. They couldn't understand the noisy fun and loudness of the Italians and Spaniards or the brawling of the Irish. It was all new to them, and they did not like it. Their peaceful little country village became a madhouse, but it brought money, business, prosperity, wealth, the granite did, and no man can go about denying it. All profited alike, farmers, landowners, storekeepers, businessmen, every one. Still, they did not like us at first, the native folks for the most. They looked down on us like an army of invaders. But we had our trade to work at, our steady money coming in, our own countrymen and friends, and our own pride of self and country. So we did not mind it so much. And it changed as time went on. People mingled more and became friends. I was a fair enough carver, so they say, but I was never with the best of them. The best ones came from Italy. No better workmen, maybe, but with more of the artist in them, more of the inspiration, like the old-time sculptors they were. One of the finest, a slim, fair Italian, a statue cutter, he died at 30 or younger. He had beauty in himself, and he could put it into the stone. All of the best ones are gone now. The last real one, the best one left, had to stop working some time ago. They do everything by machines now. It still needs workmen of skill, but not the artists. They are gone, once and for all. Oh, oh. 
It is the curse of the world today, the machines, and everywhere men out of work. That makes for unhappiness and misery and trouble. Take away a man's job and you kill the man. Maybe the dust killed them, but being without work kills them inside, a worse way. And the young people are hurt too. They finish with school and what is there for them? If they do find work, the pay is small, too small. They can save no money. They can put no money in the bank. They can't get ahead. They cannot afford to get married. What are they going to do? I don't know. I still look for hope. Something will happen. Something must happen. God forbid it will have to be war again for this country. We must have patience and faith. Sometimes it's not easy. For the young especially not, it's a lesson that only the years can teach. I am not sorry now to sit aside and watch the world go by. It goes too fast. It has gone ahead too fast. That is the great wrong. The minds of men have raced ahead more than the good Lord meant for them, and now men are paying for this. We have been happy enough here, Mary and I. We still talk and think of Scotland. People don't forget the homeland. But now it is too far, too late to go back. And we might be like strangers there. And it would hurt to feel so in your own land. So we'll stay on here and all for the best, I think, with the bombs falling like rain on the British Isles. There's a lot of talk about Barry still being wild and bad. I do not think it's much different from any other place. People are much the same everywhere. Maybe there are more nationalities here, or mixed up. But still, they are men and women and children not so different from one another. I read in a book once about this young man, a haunted man he was. There was a little white church over the town and a graveyard beside it. The boy had never seen such a quiet place of peace, and all the people had pleasant faces. To read it would make you want to go there. Well, he asked a woman if the folks there were not kinder and happier and more lawful than in other places. She answered him, No, I think they are much like all people everywhere. We have men who like too much drink. We have girls who get babies without being married. We have people who steal and cheat and lie, just like anywhere in the world. She accepted that, as we all must accept it. There are still fine people, too. That is how I feel about Barry and the people of Barry. It does not look like that village in the book. Ah, it may look like the opposite, as you know, but the people here are the same as there or anywhere you go. No worse or no better on the whole. That is another lesson it takes the years to teach. That was Greg Hooker performing Donegal's story. Greg has worked in radio and journalism for most of his career, most recently at WNCS and the Times Argus. Donegal's story brought up a lot for Greg. I relate to it because the guy is clearly working class, and I've had a, I guess as long as I can remember, a working class sort of identity, sense of self. The reason that's so important to me, I guess, is because the Truth of the matter is, is that I came from a moneyed background. My father had been born into wealth, and he became a doctor himself, and so he made a good living. And so money was never a problem in, in my household. I mean, I went to fine schools. I don't, know, I don't know if I can say the best, but I mean, they were very good schools, private schools. And I just never had to worry about money. And there, there was something about it that just never, while it was very comfortable and wonderful as a child, I mean, I saw we had help, you know, domestic help uh, at times, and I never felt right about it. I always felt deep in my heart that there was something not right about 
other people coming in to clean my house. My sense of justice has always told me that there's something not right about some people having so much and other people not having enough. I don't know why this comes to mind, but I just want to share it that um, because it helped to color my um, my view of class, and that was, you know, my first year when I graduated from when I was in this elite boarding school in Connecticut. You know, I decided I applied to certain colleges to go to, and I had a choice uh, in the end between two state universities. But one of one of those state universities was um, considerably more preppy, I would say, than the other. And I, cho- I decided to go to the one that was less preppy. Uh, the one that I chose not to go to, I think it was something like 50% in-state students and 50% out-of-state students. And the one that I chose, the University of North Carolina, was 90% North Carolina students and 10% um, out-of-staters, including you know, preppies like myself. I remember doing that consciously because I wanted to go to a public school. I had never gone to a public school. I thought that would be that would be a good experience, and it was. And when I got there, it t- just so happened that uh, in the fall of that year, the cafeteria workers at the university were on strike. Well, all the cafeteria workers were black, um, and so this is a, a, a real sort of a, an important experience in my in my um, development, I guess. And that was just to see these people were really they were taking a lot of abuse. It was partly a racial thing. But it was partly an economic thing, too, you know what I mean? And, you know, that domestic help that we had that I referred to when I was a child, I mean, they were black. So my, my, um, my sense of, uh, of uh, justice is connected to not just economics, but also race. I think that that, that, I think that, that experience only solidified the sort of the original sort of instinct that I had even as a child, that there's something not right about this situation. You know, there's something not right about some people having so much money and some people having so little. You know, you live a lifetime and then see further evidence of these things that you believe in or your beliefs evolve. And, you know, working as a middle class, you know, working as being a working guy, you know, if, uh, two weeks vacation every year, you know what I mean, X number of holidays and that's it. And actually, Plenty of part-time jobs I've had with no benefits. The job I'm doing right now, I have no benefits. You know, I'm working 25 hours a week, but no benefits if I'm sick. What I'm trying to say is, is that over the course of my life, I had these instincts and these early impressions, you know, in my teens and 20s. And now, and now that I'm in my mid-60s, I have worked with many people over the years in different settings with people who struggle. Uh, I mean, I know I understand what it's like living paycheck to paycheck. That's the way it was for me and my wife, really. That's the world that I inhabited for the last forty years in my working career, and um, so I, I understand what that's like. I, I went into a field, and my father left me alone, and so it was up to me. It wasn't like I had a free ride all the way. It wasn't like, dare I say, in politics. I mean, like the the current president and his children who just sort of become their own, their own business people because they have access to billions of dollars or whatever. No, it wasn't like that at all for me. We were on our own. You know, I, I, my, my, my retirement years are, uh, we've got a little set aside that'll last for a few years, but mostly it's going to come down to Social Security. So, you know, when they talk in Washington about cutting Social Security, I mean, I take it personally. It makes me very angry when they, they act as if it's an entitlement program. Entitlement is a word. You know, I understand that words are used not always for the purest of purposes, but I, I resent it. I mean, I, I've, I've paid into that for 40 years, and they should not be borrowing from that fund to pay for their extravagances. I mean, I, I just think that we are extravagant in some, in some ways. I mean, I happen to be of the political persuasion that we could save a lot of money by cutting back on our military spending, you know, other ways too, you know, I really feel like some people make more money than they should, really. There's a part of me that sort of feels almost, would it be socialist or Marxist or something like that, like limit some people's incomes? Although I got to say, you know, remember when I'm a big baseball fan and, and years ago, the players were, you know, they, they didn't make great money. You know, maybe they did okay, but now they make tremendous amounts of money. Some people think they shouldn't, but you know, I'm not so sure about that. They work hard. They're, they're elite talent. 
I paid $100 for a seat at a baseball game a couple of weeks ago. You know, I'd pay $100 to go to a Broadway show too. You know, that doesn't really bother me too much because these are elite talents. But there are some people that, um, that do make too much money. You know, these people with, uh, you know, the guy, you know, gets like a $400 million payout package or something like that. He doesn't need $400 million. But, I, but I'm not smart enough to figure out what the solution is. And that's where I come back to the guy's story. He says it's sort of a sense of resignation. Hopefully the people that come up behind me will be able to figure out my children and their peers to do a better job than we did. I, you know, I, I worry a little bit that they will have a less secure senior citizenhood if they're successful at doing away with that entitlement program, Social Security. That's going to be hard because I don't see how my kids, I, I, don't, I don't see how they can save money. It's really hard, really hard saving money. Well, uh, you know, the paragraph or two where the guy is talking about how, you know, people are fundamentally the same, you conclude at the end, you know, that he was talking about the, some of the people being the rowdy, you know, the rowdy partier types and others not being so much in, in his earlier life. And you come to the con conclusion that people essentially are the same. That means a lot to me. I think that's true. People deep down are fundamentally the same. We all want the same things. Greg has touched on a subtle point that, while not obvious, is intimated in Donegal's story. Donegal's story made Greg think about the strike of mostly African-American cafeteria workers at his university. In Donegal's and his own story, Greg discovered how different forms of hate and oppression are used to divide the working class. Social and economic injustice is not a sign of a broken system, but a system functioning exactly as it was designed to. That system is called capitalism. Capitalism creates a class society in which the many are exploited by the few for profit. The few maintain their wealth and power over the many by pitting groups of people against each other. Racism is one of the most powerful tools of the capitalist class. Xenophobia, or fear of immigrants, is another tool. A tool that we can see being subtly wielded in Donegal's story when he talked about the Yankee immigrants looking down on newer immigrants like him. Donegal came to the United States as a highly skilled worker, but many others were refugees fleeing poverty and conflict in their homelands, such as the Irish potato famine in the mid-1800s, the devastation of World War I, and the coming of World War II. These migrants were forced to enter the United States at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. The capitalist class has always used certain ideas to defend and promote capitalism, the economic system from which their class benefits the most. The ivory towers of higher education are capitalism's ideological fountainheads. It is true now, and it was true in the early 20th century. Henry Pratt Fairchild is a prime example of an academic whose ideas were used to justify capitalism and the inequalities it creates. In brief, Fairchild was a sociologist and eugenicist who enjoyed professorships at both Yale and New York University. He was also the president of the American Eugenics Society. Eugenics was an academic discipline that aimed to improve the human race through genetic selection. It attributed social issues like poverty to the poor's genetic inferiority. It conveniently explained away the hierarchies of class and race, among other inequalities. In the early 20th century, Fairchild saw immigrants, even white ones, as being of inferior races, writing that, To be sure, the newcomers are, for the most part, white-skinned instead of colored. Yet in the mind of the average American, the modern immigrants are generally regarded as inferior peoples, races he looks down on and with which he does not wish to associate in terms of social equality. The business of the alien is to go into the mines, the foundries, the sewers, the stifling air of factories and workshops, out on the roads and railroads in the burning sun of summer, or the driving sleet and snow. 
If he proves himself a man and rises above his station and acquires wealth and cleans himself up, very well, we receive him after a generation or two. But at present he is far beneath us, and the burden of proof rests with him. End quote. Immigrants, both past and present, have been racialized. In other words, the impoverishment of many immigrants is attributed to negative racial characteristics, not the real social and economic obstacles they face. In the early 20th century, Fairchild upheld this ideology. And today, so-called scholars like Charles Allen Murray do as well. Most frightening, President Donald Trump and his administration agree. Capitalist business owners have exploited the immigrants' precarious position throughout history. Scottish immigrants like Donegal, for example, were brought in as strikebreakers in Texas during the late 1800s. In Barrie, French-Canadian immigrants were used as strikebreakers on several occasions, including a month-long strike for better wages in 1922. Mine and quarry owners materially benefited from these divide-and-conquer tactics and fueled national anti-immigrant sentiments that would benefit them for generations to come. But unlike people of color, these white ethnics of so-called inferior races could prove their whiteness through good behavior, specifically by being meek and industrious, as Fairchild suggested. It is telling that Donegal's counterpoint to the negative reactions of the Yankees was that they worked hard and were able to earn steady money, and so Donegal commented, Things changed as time went on. Or they could prove their whiteness by perpetuating the racist ideologies of the ruling class, turning themselves into tools of the elite. The ruling class gave certain segments of the working class, namely native-born whites, preferential treatment and symbolic superiority so that they would identify and align themselves with the ruling class against their own interests. The ruling class relies on creating these divisions to maintain their power because, at the end of the day, the working class, in all of its diversity, and the ruling class have competing interests. The working class wants a dignified life, and the ruling capitalist class takes away everything needed for a dignified life, in the name of profit. During times of economic crisis, legitimate fears about basic survival can turn sinister. The Global Depression of the 1930s fanned the flames of racism, spreading fascism, and war. People were turning against each other, seeing their neighbors as competitors versus members of their own class with whom they should act in solidarity. Fears about immigrants and people of color taking away jobs were compounded by fears of machines and automation. As Donegal contended, the dust may have killed his fellow carvers, but the machines, by taking away a person's job, killed them in a worse way. It is ironic, however, that the technological advances in the granite industry were not only killing jobs, but killing the workers themselves. New pneumatic tools, for example, produced record levels of dust compared to traditional hand tools. And while they were choking on stone dust up north, huge numbers of homesteaders down south were choking on soil dust in the infamous Dust Bowl, where soil that had once been held down by native grasses had been torn up by new gas-powered combines. It could be otherwise. The working class could overcome the divisions sown by the ruling class and use technology to make all of our lives better instead of worse. As Donegal said over 80 years ago, something will happen. Something must happen. How do you think about class? Did you relate to Donegal's story? Does your community have a significant immigrant population? What divisions does your community face, and how have people tried to overcome them? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page, send us a tweet at Podcast, or email us at onmasspodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E 
podcast. For the next episode, we will hear the story of Palmira Fernandez. Like many immigrant families, Palmira's family wanted more for her than becoming the widow of a stone carver. Silicosis cut short many stone carvers' lives. As a working class immigrant woman, the only way Palmira could have a better life was to work hard in one of the few vocations open to her. And she did work hard. She worked as hard as the men in the granite industry in a new and growing industry, telecommunications. Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archive footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. We are an independently produced show. We receive support from you, our listeners. If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to Greg Hooker for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain